Star Wars The Force Awakens has redeemed the Star Wars franchise. Keeping the hood up because it's a bit more Jedi-esque. Um, I gotta make a video talking about this. Um, I'm just such a huge Star Wars fan my entire life. Uh, I consider it one of the greatest trilogy of films ever made. Not the prequels, of course. Uh, George Lucas should be embarrassed that someone like J.J. Abrams just picked up on this midstream, took his story, and evolved it into something that was every bit on par with what Star Wars A New Hope, Return of the Jedi, and The Empire Strikes Back, tri Strikes Back ever was. Um, this movie is as good as those three original films. Now, spoiler warnings. I'm going to be talking about spoilers in this film. Um, if you haven't seen the film and you don't want it spoiled, frankly, I, I wish you could be like me and go in completely unspoiled. I don't even know how I made it up to yesterday morning without having anything, anything major about the movie spoiled. The most I saw was the one teaser trailer that basically showed nothing other than Harrison Ford in the end saying, Chewie, we're home. Um, other than that, I saw absolutely nothing about this film, had nothing, no idea what it was ultimately about going in. Anyways, I hope that you too can go with the same experience because it made it that much better. <coughs> Excuse me. Force choked. Um, the villain in this movie, Kylo Ren, I absolutely, absolutely loved what they did with this character and where they went for as far as what the main villain was. Um, I have somebody argue that well, the main villain is the, um, the general who I'm forgetting the name of, the blonde guy that, you know, fires the death cannon. Um, oh, shit, forget his name. Anyways, sorry, Star Wars geeks. I don't have everyone's name from the movie memorized. Uh, Kylo Ren, uh, him being Han Solo's son, being trained by Luke Skywalker, having the division in his mind that's established of, you know, is he going to fall to the light side? Is he going to stay to the dark side? And that being a bit more mysterious and questionable than comparatively to Darth Vader in episodes four, five, and six, where it's like, you saw Darth Vader, it's like, oh, this guy's, you know, he's not fucking around. He's, he's full, full-time dark side. There's no question about it. Where Kylo Ren, it's like, I don't know, maybe this guy can turn. He sounds kind of soft. He, he comes a, a bit more, he comes off a bit more human. He wasn't nowhere near as much trained as a Jedi as Anakin Skywalker was, who then became Darth Vader. So you're, you're left thinking that, like, you know, is this guy going to become a good black guy by the end of this movie rather than where Darth Vader, you know, took him to the end of episode six before he finally became a good guy and helped his son out. Um... I, I just, I just, I, I love the way they did this. I love the fact that they, they gave an actual, you know, human being. It wasn't some disfigured guy when he finally takes off his mask. Um, I thought up, up to that point, until you finally heard his, his voice and you saw that it was the actual actor, I actually thought it was Javier Bardeen, um, doing, doing the voice, like how James Earl Jones did it for, for Darth Vader. Uh, cause it sounded like Javier and I was like, I was, I was like, oh man, that's cool. They got, yeah. I got a guy from no country for old men to do the voice. And then they take some math and I'm like, oh no, it's just some guy. Anyway, um, that was interesting. Uh, there's a lot of questions that obviously arise from this movie in, um, who the hell is Ray? What is her relation? I have no fucking clue. Uh, two guys that I went to the movie with, we, like, we were discussing this after the film. We were, that's how jazzed up we were about the movie. We were just like standing in the parking lot. We had to go in the parking lot because we started like talking about it in the lobby. Uh, and one guy was like, you know, maybe we shouldn't be talking so loud. There's people waiting in line to go see the movie. And I was like, yeah, that's a good call. So we went outside. Um, the character of Ray, it's, it's interesting. And uh, I see a lot of criticism about this now in that she was never trained in the ways of the Force, but she obviously has Force powers that are established more and more as the movie goes on. Like, she knows to give the one Stormtrooper the Jedi mind trick to get her to be released from her shackles, to drop his gun, to leave the cell door open. But it's like, how would she know to do that? How does she know about Darth Vader when when Kylo Ren is trying to do the mind read, the force mind read with his hand, he, she mentions like, you know, you'll never be as powerful as Darth Vader. Like, how does she even know that? 
Is she reading Kylo Ren's mind? Does she know how to do it? Like the point that I, that I got from that is that she is somehow a creation of the Force. Um, kind of like how, you know, <laughs> Anakin Skywalker was born without a father. I think we're going to go back down that storyline again. Like, a lot of people are saying, like, this is Luke's daughter. This is Luke's daughter. And I don't think it's going to be something that obvious. I really don't. I think it's going to be something. She's some sort of hybrid creation of the Force, something that was either created spiritually with the Force or something, because even that final battle with Kylo Ren, when she's, you know, holding her lightsaber, when Kylo Ren's got his lightsaber up, and she's holding it, and like, she just closes her eyes, and, like, the power of the Force just, you know, compels her to take over in the fight and kick whoever Kylo Ren, whatever relation Kylo Ren is to her, and Kylo Ren knows who she is. At least that's what I got that vibe, and, like, you know, she was stunned that he was stunned that she was discovered and freaked out when she escaped because he knew she was important in some way. And I don't buy the fact that people are trying to say like she's related to Han Solo in that you see the younger version of her, like the five-year-old girl version of her reaching up, going like, no, don't go, or something along those lines. And you see the ship fly away that was like the junker that Han Solo and Chewie were flying around and when they got the Millennium Falcon recaptured. Um, it was that same plane that Harrison Ford was in when they recaptured the Millennium Falcon. Um, I don't buy that. It's 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 a it's a daughter of 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 Han Solo and Leia. I don't buy that. That's again, that's way too obvious. Then again, it's it's obvious that Kylo Ren was you know a relative of someone in the the bloodline here. Obviously, if he's a Jedi, because they're dumping that fucking Metaclorian shit, which is the best move. Um, they're going back to what we established in episodes 4, 5, and 6, that you have to be like the bloodline of the Jedi to become a Jedi, alright? It's not just some mythical little creature powers that are in every single entity and molecule. Fuck George Lucas, what were you smoking? Anyway, um, <laughs> and that's the thing too. I saw a review of Red Letter Media that made a couple months ago, and they asked the question, I saw this after I watched the movie, um, they said to each other, it was, uh, Mike and Rich Evans saying, um, you know, will there be anything from this movie from the prequels in this? And they said, they said, no, absolutely not. Uh, the only one thing that I could find from this movie that was in the prequels, and if someone else out there that saw the movie can name anything, either a character that was ju that was just in the prequels, or some sort of concept or function, or or like even like a spaceship that was just notably just from the prequels that appeared in this film. The only one thing that I noted that was directly from just the prequels, and it's partly from Episode Four, and I'll get to that in a second is when Kylo Ren is being talked to by the general and, um, you know, they're not getting their job done, they're not finding BB-8, they're not finding the, fi the missing piece, or they're not finding the piece of the map to lead them to Luke Skywalker. Uh, when the general says, um, do I have to involve the usage of, a clone, of, the, of the clone army in here? In, or clone stormtroopers, I forget the exact terminology, but they referenced that the stormtroopers or that there was certain brigades or regiments of the, 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 the stormtroopers that were clones. Now, that wasn't really noted until the prequels that the, 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 the stormtroopers were actual clones or that there was sections of them because obviously with um, Finn being, you know, a black guy that doesn't look like Django Fett, like every single one of the stormtroopers looked like in the prequels. Um, that was the only thing I could f I could find that was directly linked and taken from the prequels. Now I know a lot of you are going to say like, oh well, remember when Obi Wan he said you know his his father was involved or he was involved in the Clone Wars, 
Um, they reference the Clone Wars there, but they never really established that the Clone Wars meant that the Stormtroopers were the actual clones themselves. What I was getting at is that the actual Stormtroopers being clones was the only possible thing that I could find linked to the prequels. If anyone else can find something else that was directly from pre pre prequels, I'm all ears. But that is what I love. That is Disney and J.J. Abrams basically saying, George, you done fucked up with that prequel shit. We'll put your Lucasfilm limited uh, industrial light and, match logo, light and magic logo on the beginning, Lucasfilm whatever, on the beginning of the film. That's about as much respect we're paying you to the prequels. Um, I, I guess that's one thing you could link to the prequels, the Lucasfilm limited logo that came on right before uh, in a galaxy far, far away. Um, I love it. Because this movie, like I said, was on par with episodes four, five, and six, and the reason why it was is it was it was more just organic, natural. It wasn't synthetic CGI monsters and even like even like half the stormtroopers in the prequels were CGI. Obviously, because they couldn't have ten hundred actors playing, you know, identical Django Fets, but um even the beginning scene, like you see the stormtroopers, there's like a flashing light, and you see that they're physical actors in stormtrooper outfits, and they're going out in a live desert shooting things. There is like nothing CGI other than laser blasts and maybe some explosions. But I'm like, holy shit, this looks like one of the original fucking Star Wars films, episodes four through six. I don't care, I'm calling them the original ones, even if even if they're not one, two, three. And it was so fucking refreshing. I just, I gave a big sigh of relief. I was like, okay, they're not going to fuck this up. Like, you know, the stormtroopers aren't riding on these big galactic elephant hippopotamus hybrids that spit fire and laser beams out their ass. Draw a picture of that, someone. Uh, like, it was, like, that's what you would have seen if George Lucas was making this movie. And then uh, fucking the sky would have opened in, in, a, in a reverse vagina monster, like like that one that swallowed Boba Fett in, in episode four, episode five, episode six. Um, you see like a ver reverse vagina monster come out of the sky and start like grabbing people. And anyways, um, though you did have you did have a little CGI like on Han Solo's ship where those monsters break free and they see something like that. I'm like, okay, there you go. That's, you know, using that sparingly, I can live with it. But when everything is CGI I'm, and you see the prequels or you see the Gungan King going, I'm like, this ain't fucking Star Wars. This is fucking shit. And there wasn't a single moment in that movie that I said, this is fucking shit. Why did they include this? This is fucking dumb. It wasn't a single fucking time I said that. And I'm just like, I can't wait. I can't wait to see where the story goes from here. Because this movie ends with a barely scratching the surface of explanation. It just gave you a hundred different avenues to take. And what is going to ultimately be explained, I, who knows? Because I want to know what Kylo Ren and the... Uh, the Knights of Ren that you see for a brief second or two, like, were they the ones that went back and got Darth Vader's burnt uh, mask? Because obviously they would have had to track down Luke Skywalker at some point because Luke was the only one that knew the whereabouts because he was the one that actually set his father on fire and cremated and had his ashes. And also it's like, when Kylo Ren first takes off his mask, he slams it down. It's in like a pile of dust. And I'm like, is that Darth Vader's ashes? Is that one of the things that the, the Knights of Ren collected? Um, so th th there's like so much, there's so much backstory that we can go just before this movie and explain, you know, why was the child version of Rey screaming up at that ship that was the same one that Han Solo flew in to, to intercept the, the, the Millennium Falcon? Um, you know, why did Kylo Ren turn to the dark side ultimately? Was it just because of Snoke's influence? Like, what what else happened? Like, there had to be something else. And who exactly is fucking Rey? Because I'm not sold on the fact that it's Luke Skywalker's daughter. I'm just, I'm not sold on that. Um, anyway, this movie was just so fucking good. Now, I'd be remiss to say it's perfect. So... I want to end the video here talking about some of the negatives, all right? One of the major negatives, and 
again, this may just be seen as geek nitpicking, but when I say it's on par with episodes 4, 5, and 6, it's very close on par with episode 4 in that it's damn near the identical storyline. <laughs> I mean, it's instead of Luke in the desert figuring things out, getting the droid, it's, it's this girl, Rey, getting BB-8, wandering through, figuring out the story, uh, you know, meeting up, getting to the Millennium Falcon, much like Luke did, uh, meeting Chewie and Han, and, and all that, pretty much in the same order that they were found out in Episode 4, comparative to this one. Um, the creation of a Death Star. Um, this one is the... Fuck, the super mega killer universe planet thing. Um, anyways, the super mega killer universe planet thing was very similar to the Death Star in that it was just this big thing that floated around, shot out a mass laser beam, and destroyed planets. You had the same thing with the Death Star. But on top of it being the Death Star, there's a weakness to it. And it gets pinpointed. The one thing I was saying in this movie, I was like, I was like boy, this is paralleling A New Hope. Very much so, but I was like, there is no fucking way they are going to kill a third fucking Death Star. Son of a bitch, it blew up. I saw this and I was like, I was like, oh no, JJ, 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 JJ. This is, this is number one, this is very lacking in creativity because you're just taking the basic plot and the, you know, it's like the hero flies in through unforeseen circumstances when Bo takes the X-Wing through an absolute sliver that was created by the, the bombing that was left by um, Chewie and Han. And he saves the day, flies out just in the nick of time as it explodes. And I'm just like, oh my god. <sighs> Same thing. X-Wing goes in, intercepts the weak spot. Kaboom. Death Star number three down. All right, it's but one both lacking in creativity, and it just makes the Empire look fucking retarded. For being a galactic empire, they said, "Damn, that first Death Star got blown up. Um, had a weak spot, and then oh fuck, our second one got destroyed. We didn't even finish building it yet. Well, that's okay, because we're gonna we're gonna make one, and we're gonna build a planet around it. It's gonna be like the size of literally 50 Death Stars, and it's gonna harness the power of the sun." And it's gonna fuck shit up ten times fold over what the Death Star you Ah, oh, it's got a weak spot, it blew up dead. You know, I've always asked this. <laughs> Ever since I've seen Star Wars, I can remember this as a kid too. Um, there's a scene in A New Hope where, you know, Luke wants to take off real quick and Han's like, he's like, oh easy kid, this ain't like dusting crops, you gotta set the coordinates or else, you know, you'll end up in an asteroid field or something, okay? What they're inferring is, before you go into hyperdrive, light speed, whatever you want to call it, you have to set coordinates or else, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll crash into a planet, crash into an asteroid field, whatever. Why in the Star Wars universe has there never been any sort of weaponized, um, light speed warp drive weapons because like I was like I was like when Han had to get into a super mega death star of destruction that harnesses the sun power he figured out that there's a flaw in the um, in the force field that there's a fractional reset um, refresher in the force field. So if you fly at light speed at the force field, you'll fly through so fast that you'll hit the fractional refresh rate and then as long as your coordinates are that you refresh under the under the force field, you'll be fine. So I'm like, well if that's the case, why the fuck don't they just send something at light speed towards the fucking Death Star and let it crash through it? Because, as they established in episode 4, if you don't set the coordinates, you'll crash into a fucking planet. And if you send something at light speed through it, there's going to be like a if like the Millennium Falcon hit the Death Star at light speed, there's going to be a Millennium Falcon sized hole. So it's like, okay, aim that at dead center, or aim that at the fucking cannon, and let's see if it fires after the Millennium Falcon crashes into it at light speed. Like, is that not mo the most simple thing to do? I don't know.
I just always thought that, that that's a significant flaw in the explanation, the plot, and the ability of having things go at light speed, and that's never addressed of how that's defensed, because it would be impossible to defense, unless you have some sort of, like, I, I know in some of the cartoons or whatever, there's like these magnetic powered ships that pull things out of hyperspace and those are serve as defense, but they don't have that yet. So why aren't they having some sort of weaponized light speed missile? Just bye bye Death Star. We don't need to send the X-Wings in. Or just have the fucking thing set the coordinates to the center of the Death Star and have, have it filled with thermal detonators and have it play like, you know, a, a audio mp3 clip of Luke laughing and going ha 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 happy birthday motherfuckers <laughs> am I the crazy one here anyway um, Kylo Ren and I know a lot of people that I'm finding out now had this spoiled that Kylo Ren is the son of Han Solo and that he kills his father in this when that scene happened when Kylo Ren walks out on that center platform, I was like, number one, I was like, I was like, boy, that's strange. Why didn't he sense his father standing on the pillar? Like, they're literally, at one point, they're like three feet apart, and Han Solo's like on a pillar looking up at him as he's walking in. He's like, it's my fucking son, Ben. I'm gonna go out there and call him bitch ass out. And I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, why didn't he sense him? I'm like, oh, he's drawing him out to kill him. Like, the second, the second he didn't sense that Han Solo, his father, was there, I was like, he's drawing him out to kill him. And that's exactly what fucking happened. When Han walks out on that platform and yells out, Ben, I'm like, bye. We just, <laughs> Han Solo is so fucking dead. And then when you see the sun energy gets sucked out and it goes from light to dark and Han has his hand on the lightsabers, I was like, it's over. Han gets killed epically, lightsaber through the stomach, falls into the abyss. And Chewie, a character who I've never really liked in the Star Wars universe, goes fucking ballistic and starts mowing down motherfuckers. And I love Chewie in this movie. Uh, there's two characters I really love. BB-8 and Chewie, for the non-main characters, that is. I love them in this film. They were great. Chewie going postal when he sees his best friend and I don't know if you want to call Han his master, for lack of a better term, master. When he starts shooting stormtroopers and then shoots Kylo Ren, which comes in key at the end. I was like, oh my god, that was fucking awesome. And then runs out, sets off the detonators and helps save the day. Granted, the... The cannon was still functional on the super mega Death Star floating ice palace of destruction force destroyer 5000. Anyway, um, I, that, that was that was great. Chewie, Chewie was used perfectly. BB-8 was used perfectly. Even C-3PO coming in in a, in a limited capacity was used great. Um, another people, another thing I, I jumped off my whole thing about critiquing. Um, the whole pe people are critiquing the fact that Finn held his own to a relative extent against a trained Jedi in Kylo Ren when he has Luke's lightsaber and starts fighting with Kylo Ren. It doesn't just get like killed like that. Um, the thing that I think people are forgetting is that number one, right before that battle takes place, <coughs> Kylo Ren force pushes Rey. 50 feet into the air, into a fucking tree, I'm like, well, she's dead, and that's what Finn thinks when he sees her, and he's like, he's like, you motherfucker, it's on, and he, that's when he takes out Luke Skywalker's lightsaber, turns it on, and goes to fucking have a throwdown with Kylo Ren, and a lot of people had a problem with that, like I said, that he's holding his own in the fight, but it was established that, number one, he used that force push, Fucking maximum force power to throw that bitch 50 feet up in the air against a tree. And he keeps hitting the side where 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 Chewbacca shot him. And it's showing you basically that he's mortally wounded. And that's the thing. Using that maximum force on top of being mortally wounded is going to bring him down a rung or two as far as his Jedi capabilities. Like, I'm sorry, I totally believe that Finn was holding his own in that fight, and I didn't think it was that much of a stretch. 
Um, I, mean, it, I mean, frankly, Finn gets overtaken rather easily, and then obviously Ray comes back, uh, takes Luke Skywalker's lightsaber, and then, you know, goes to town on him. And <laughs> one thing, another thing that I want to criticize is, is while this is going on, while Ray and Kylo Ren are fighting, um, the X-Wings finally corrupt the Super Mega Death Star 5000. They um, uh, disable the, oh, the fucking regurgitating malfunctioners, whatever the fuck it was called. And there's a huge-ass explosion in that area. And you see an overhead shot. Now, Kylo Ren, Rey, Chewbacca, Han Solo, and Finn were all in that targeted area about three minutes ago. When you see the, the X-Wings disable this, it goes to an overhead shot, and you see an explosion, and a ripple of explosion go out. Where I'm like, I'm like, oh shit, they're gonna be feeling that in that little battle they're having out there in the forest. And it goes back to them and there's like, there's like nothing. I'm like, how the fuck far away did they get in three minutes? But anyways, that's a minor point because I think they should have been fucked up by that explosion. Um, if you watch from the overhead, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, oh yeah, I think Kylo Ren and Rey are gonna feel a little bit of that aftershock and it was nothing. Anyway, um... Again, that fight with, with Rey and Kylo Ren, where Rey basically overtakes him, bitches him out. Granted, he's, he's mortally wounded, on top of being weakened from, you know, just the, the force scene and all that shit. And I just, I, I, something is going to be explained with Rey to explain why she's so powerful and why she knows so much about the force without ever being formally taught. Or if she was formally taught, Maybe she had her mind erased in some way, and like maybe that's why she doesn't, you know, realize who her mother and father are and stuff like that. I, who knows? Who knows? But that's what leads us to the next episode, and I'm just like, I, I can't fucking wait to see where this story's going from here. Because J.J. Abrams did this franchise every bit of respect, every ounce of justice, and as a Star Wars fan, I don't know how you could not leave that audience pleased. Um, if you didn't see Star Wars, honestly, it's, it's not saying you won't enjoy this film, but you will not enjoy this film as much because the, the whole time I kept seeing like, how many times am I going to see a reference to the former films, be it the Millennium Falcon, the little toaster riding around on wheels, the, the, the garbage can that walks around legs, the, the Oriental droid that flew in the Millennium Falcon with, um, with Lando Calrissian in, in Return of the Jedi. Like, there's so many things, so many things that are just so nostalgic. And nothing that brought up nostalgia the prequels. This was about as perfect as I could expect this to be done. Disney did a fantastic job taking over this and getting the ideas from George Lucas of what he thought this story would go. Uh, this was actually submitted by George Lucas. This actually happened where he submitted his ideas of where he feels the storyline arc would go, where everyone would be, what Luke and Leia would be doing, etc., etc. And Disney put their hands on the pile of papers or whatever, maybe it was just in a manila envelope, whatever, and they said, Nope! Get the fuck out of here. Thank you for doing that, Disney, because I don't think there's any way we would have seen a film as halfway as decent as The Force Awakens if George Lucas had his hand in making it. Now, granted, obviously, he deserves respect because without him, none of this would have existed. And I have nothing but respect for George for making the first uh, episodes four, five, and six. They're masterpieces of film. Even with the Ewoks and how just obnoxiously dumb they are. But if George Lucas was making this film, again, big elephant-sized hippopotamus, hippopotamuses with lasers shooting out their asses. That's what you would, you would have gotten. Stormtroopers riding on big hippopotamus, elephant-sized hippos. Is that what you wanted, guys? Or do you want that real shit that J.J. Abrams wants? J.J. Abrams brought the real fucking deal back to Star Wars. I fucking love it. I just wish I could skip ahead in time to a year and a half 
this is where I wish I had like the, the Back to the Future DeLorean because like you know you could knock out like trilogies of films like this in just like you know a day an afternoon because I could be like oh wow I watched that movie let me hop in the DeLorean just land back at the movie theater here in a year and a half ah oh, there we go episode eight let's do this okay I'll go hop in the uh, episode nine all right yeah okay boom done but flying DeLoreans that travel through time don't exist yet anyways fantastic fucking film you guys out there what did you think about it did you hate it did you think it paralleled a new hope because because i hear a lot of people complain about that and i can understand and frankly that is a lack of creativity but you know what it was also also a refreshing lack of creativity that's what i choose to look at it more as because it's like this feels like star wars this feels like star wars and the Gungan King going, ah, blah, 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 blah. that doesn't feel like Star Wars. It feels like I'm, I, I'm watching a made-for-TV kids kids movie. It feels like I'm watching Baby's Day Out, which was reviewed by Mr. Plinkin on top of all the other Mr. Plinkin reviews, which you should be checking out, specifically those Star Wars ones. Red Letter Media, cheap plug for them, because frankly, they've helped rejuvenate. People at Red Letter Media have absolutely helped rejuvenate my interest in Star Wars, because it dwindled to damn near fucking nothing with what George Lucas and the prequels did to that. But seeing them tear the prequels apart over there, specifically in the Plinkett reviews, it got it got my Star Wars gears going again. I want to thank them personally for that in the end of this video. So, anyways, have a good day, better tomorrow, and let's be as cliche as fucking possible. May the Force be with you. Oh, it's so fucking corny. Bye, guys.